Greetings, Tony from Old River Hardwoods again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the fascinating world of chair makers tools. Like all the other specialized trades like coopering, wheel riding, chair makers required certain tools to perform certain tasks. And we're going to examine a few of those and talk about the history of some of those. And there's a lot to cover, so sit back and enjoy. First, we're going to talk about some of the edge tools that chair makers use. Besides your standard draw knives and spoke shaves, there are a couple of specialized ones that uh, they use. The one on the left is a true scorp. This has a curved blade. That one was about five inches across. The one on the right is a box scraper used for taking labels off of old wooden shipping crates, but because of the curved blades, it got a lot of guys use them as scorps. Unfortunately, a lot of folks online tend to misidentify them as scorps when they, in fact, are box scrapers, although I do label them as both. Another specialized sh tool is the Tavisher spoke shave. The one on the left is a real Tavisher with a curved blade. That was made in England. The one on the right is actually a heel shave made for leather work. It's a lot smaller. The blade's only two inches across, where the Tavisher was three inches. Uh, those also can be used for chair making. I've sold a lot of them over the years for that. And they were made by several different makers. Some of them have the standard uh, body style with the tangs going through the body. Sometimes you'll find one where the tangs are held in place with either screws or little captive wood pieces. Uh, with those guys, of course, it's important that the blade removes. Because if you can't get the blade out, you're not going to be able to sharpen them. Uh, those don't show up very often anymore. I recently sold one, but that's the first one I've had in quite a number of years. Another tool along those lines is what's called a chairmaker's devil. This is a scraper with a curved sole used for shaping and finishing spindles and legs. Both of these were user crafted. The one on the left uses a couple of screws to hold the blade in place. One on the right is a screw at the top that holds the blade which allows it to be adjusted. Uh, these guys, I've seen some really fancy ones of these guys, and but they are not very common at all. I mean, I had both of these guys 15 years ago, and they're the only pictures I could find of them. So, if you find one, grab it. Next, we're going to be looking at the tools used by chair makers for making round tenons. Here we have an assortment of those devices. Uh, a few of these aren't in really usable condition, but I just happen to have them around for show and tell. So, lots to cover, and I hope you're taking notes, because there might be a pop quiz at the end. First up are the spoke pointers. These are used to round down the end of the stock slightly, or taper the end of the stock slightly, so it'll fit into the hollow auger, so that you can cut the actually cut the tenon with. You'd be surprised at how many people I've run into over the years that were, had a hollow auger and couldn't get the thing to work because nobody bothered to tell them about the spoke pointer. One of the most common ones you'll find are the EC sterns. You can tell that by the decorative casting on the bell. This one unfortunately has a cracked blade, which is why, why it's still here. Uh, these do have an adjustable tang that's ruled that can be used as a depth stop. And Edward C. Stearns was granted a patent on October 7th, 1879 for the design of this tool. These were made in a number of different sizes. This one's about the medium-sized one. Uh, I've had them as small as 2 inches. I've had them as big as uh, up to 4.5 inches. This one here, which is in usable shape, see if I can find the name, there it is, was made by the A.A. Woods, A.A. Wood and Sons Company of Atlanta, Georgia. They were in business from 1875 until 1910 or so. 
Uh, they made some really nice tools he made. He patented a couple different hollow augers. And uh, this, one's, this one's ready to go. I mean, this one I cleaned up and whatever. One thing to watch out for these guys, if you're buying one online, is to make sure you ask the seller that the screws work. Because if the screws don't work, the tool is basically no good. And I've had more than my share of these guys that the screws don't work on. The tang screw, well, that's not that critical in this particular model. But the blade screws, if they don't turn, yeah. Also make sure that you do have some blade life left, which is kind of sad about this guy because it's got a lot of blade, but there's that crack. Um... Nearly impossible to find replacements unless you want to make your own or whatever. But that's probably not the most important thing. That make sure the tangs aren't too dinged up on them. I mean, these aren't too bad. But they are handy tools. And let me tell you, they ain't getting any easier to come by. Next up, we have the fixed cut hollow augers. These are made in sizes from a quarter of an inch all the way up to one inch. And there's several different styles that you'll encounter out there. If you look at the picture, the one in the upper right corner, the screw comes down at an angle to lock the blade through the top of the body. The second one was made by the James Swan Company. There the screw goes through the blade into the body, and there's also a second screw on the side for adjusting the angle of the blade a little bit. And the last one, um, these are made by PS&W and a number of companies, where the screw goes, again, from the top, right down to the, right down into the blade. A couple of things to watch out for, for with these guys. This one here, unfortunately, the tang was too bent up and twisted to use. I pulled the blades and screws off, thinking I'd need them for something else, but where they are, I have no idea. With this style, and this is a one-inch one, these screws go down into the cavity here, but there's a little tiny metal spacer, slightly smaller than the diameter of the screw. When you remove the screw and start pulling the blade out, a lot of times that little spacer will get lost. So if you're going to work on one of these, make sure you're doing it in a box so you can catch pieces. I mean, it's an easy fix. You just take a nail and a hacksaw and a little custom and you're back in business. But just something to watch out for. Obviously, you want good tangs. You don't want... These are all sharpened chisel style so you may want to make sure that you have halfway decent blades but with this style it's a little easier to fabricate a new blade with and that's why they're fairly popular but again this is one of those things I'm not seeing too much of anymore and here we have an assortment of adjustable hollow augers the first one was patented the design of this one was patented by Gian Stearns on May 7th 1878 the blade clamp has a patent date of March 5th 1878 which was actually for the design of a different style of adjustable hollow auger but they carried the patent over and the blade clamp over to this one and it's a fairly simple design oh, I got the screw too tight but you loosen this screw here and then this head rotates in order to increase the width of the cut. Fairly durable. Now these guys did have depth stops, but most of the time they're missing. And they've been, from my experience, they're a little aggravating because they, they don't really clamp on very well. And besides, real men don't need depth stops. Again, you want to watch out for the tanks not all beat up. Obviously, with something like this, you definitely want to make sure that all the screws work. Uh, the blade on this one is sharpened to a knife edge rather than a chisel edge. So a little pitting's not going to be too much of a problem. And this style of blade's, again, kind of an easy replacement. But this is a good, solid, durable design that was made for many, many a year. Here we have... 
Brown and A. A. Woods hollow auger. Albert A. Wood was granted a patent on November 27th, 1900 for the design of this tool. And you can see you screw system here to adjust it. You got your cutter there, blade clamp. And these are considered by many folks to be the Cadillac of hollow augers, although this one looks like it was used for hauling manure more than one time. Haven't decided whether or not I'm going to clean it or not. Uh, that'll be a project for a day when I really got nothing better to do. Here's a picture of one that was in a little better shape that I sold a few years back. And they are, uh, they are good solid tools, that's for sure. Note, some of these have round tangs. Uh, some of these have brace tangs on them. Depends on the application that they were being uh, used for. Another one that you find once in a while is the James Swan, May 29, 1894 patent hollow auger. Now that one's quite a gizmo. It's a fairly big, heavy tool. When they work properly, they work great. And they were made with a fitted wooden box. And if you find one with the label, that makes them even more valuable. But those are pretty neat. I don't have a live one to show right now. I haven't had, I've maybe had three of those over all the time I've been doing this. So they don't show up very often and they're definitely worth the investment. Okay, next up is the Bonnie Patent Adjustable Auger, Hollow Auger. This guy up. You can see you've got this rotating wheel. You have to back the blade out to move it. Charles Bonney of Syracuse, New York, was granted a patent on August 2nd, 1870 for the design of this tool. And it's also proved to be a very, very enduring style. Uh, note the screws there. You've got screws for adjusting the angle of the blade. Uh, from the side and the top. This one does have a broken screw on the blade clamp, but the blade does remove with that screw. Um, of course, you got the center wheel here. And in order to change, change it out, you got to back the blade out a little bit. Just rotate the wheel around. And uh, again, very solid design. These were made by EC Stearns. Here's one that's got the EC Stearns mark on it, if you can see that. Uh, they were copied by a number of folks as well. This one's got a round tang on it. But if you're looking for an adjustable one, either the Gian Stearns model or <coughs> the Bonnie Styles are, are good investments, or Woods if you can find a, find a good one. Another chairmaker's tool that I get asked for a lot, but rarely, rarely find, of course, are spoon bits. Now, these two in the picture are European. They have the flat style tangs. Um, they just do not show up very often. I had a full set of them about 15 years ago, and I can't even find a picture. It was that long ago, and these guys are from actually about 17 or 18 years ago. I mean, they just... Hard to come by and sell really, really fast. Well, Sunday's flea market ride didn't produce much this week, but it was 15 degrees Fahrenheit when I got there, and there weren't too many vendors set up, so you never know what you're going to find. But I did get a decent uh, spoon bit. These guys aren't showing up much at all. An old sergeant, stamped steel uh, divider caliper. Needs a little, little clean, but not too bad. A user crafted brass outside caliper. Also needs a little cleaning. And a Stanley number 151 spoke shave 
from the 1960s when Stanley was painting everything blue. So I'll pay for the gas this trip, nothing else. And here's some of Wednesday's finds from the flea market. The hay picking was pretty steady. Uh, sometimes when I go, you know, I get a lot of tools from one or two guys, but today it was, you know, onesie twosie finds all over the place. Got a C.S. Osborne brass headed tack hammer. Nice German uh, straight razor. I don't do those too often, but this one's really clean. A tapered reamer, a hand forged handle. Double headed pin vise, Stanley type 2 6 inch bevel square. The mark's covered with paint, but we'll get that cleaned up. An LS Starrett number 299 combination ruler clamp makes two short ones into one long one. Don't you wish life was always so easy? Uh, the Morris. A slate roofing hammer made in Banger PA. That one will clean up pretty nice. And a little different looking, small, perfect handle screwdriver. And last on this run is a quarter round, one inch molding plane. And second batch from Wednesday. Up top is a Buck Brothers. One and a half inch crank neck firmer chisel. Those guys aren't very common. This one was sold by uh, Wellman Products of Cleveland. They were a big distributor of pattern makers tools. Pretty clean. Distant and Sons saw sharpening vise, the number two. A Miller Falls, number 61A, push screwdriver, no bits, but they take the uh, same bits as the Yankees, and another hewing hatchet head. Uh, dude, this one's going to need some clean as well. I scuffed around a little bit to see if I can find a maker's mark on it. But all in all, for a cold February morning, it's pretty good pickings. And that's all for this one, folks. Time to wet the old whistle. And call it a day. I hope you enjoyed my little presentation here. And as always, if you like what you're seeing, please hit the subscribe button. Be notified when new videos are posted. Thanks again for watching and bye.